out the recording afterwards uh, and, and hope uh, you might pass that along to other people you know. So I think with that, can, folks can continue to join, but I will hand it off to, to Chris Miller and uh, I will uh, share a few slides here. Thanks for joining. Welcome everyone. I hope you can uh, hear me pretty well. We're, we're very excited today to kick off a, a new program at PEC of quarterly keynote uh, speeches and presentations by uh, folks that were inspired by, folks that are partners, folks that are working with us to make the world a better place. And uh, this is a, a wonderful opportunity for, for us to uh, learn from someone who's been truly inspirational to me, a good friend of mine, someone I, I really uh, honor for, for his work on behalf of others and I'm very excited uh, that you're joining us today. We're hoping to, to continue this series with uh, unique speakers with, with really different perspectives. And if you have ideas, please pass them on to us, either to me uh, or to one of our staff, particularly Carissa Epley, who's our director of, of development and someone who came up with the idea of trying to do this on a regular basis. Hopefully some of them will be in person, but we're glad to do this today remotely and glad that you can join. So before I introduce Mike Curtin from DC Central Kitchen, I want to give you a little perspective of you know, where this relationship comes from and, and why we think his work is so important uh, to the future of PEC. Uh, as, we, as you know, we, we, uh, we're an older, older organization. We were started in 1972. Uh, and over the past 50 years, we've worked very hard to promote and protect the uh, rural economy the natural resources, the history, and the beauty of the incredible landscape that lies west of the Washington metropolitan area in the Northern Virginia Piedmont. This is a view from the White Cliffs at Bull Run Mountains looking west of the Blue Ridge, and I think is uh, you know, one of those inspirational places. Uh, we've worked with uh, thousands of farms and food producers in the region, and as of the end of 2020, uh, about 1,500 families had worked together to protect 426,000 acres of private land to produce food, forests, uh, and outdoor space. And that's, that's the permanent base for rural, the rural economy and state and local policies uh, that go with it uh, are important so that we continue to have that as a base of, of our, our communities. Uh, in practice, what, you know, <clears throat> practice of that mission has taken many forms. Um, we do a lot of different things. Sometimes people comment we, we might be doing a little too much, but I'd rather be stretching than sitting on my, sitting on my laurels. Um, it's all deeply rooted in the need to work towards long-term sustainability and the resiliency of both our natural systems and our human environments. And I think you see great examples of both. In, in our in our region, the last year has been been interesting. It's been tough, um, but it's really drawn into focus some important aspects of what PEC does do. Uh, we've we've really focused for in one example on on helping individuals and communities uh, participate around complex issues and using new remote tools of public policy, whether it's local planning commissions and 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 debates about local circumstances or. Uh, lobbying members of Congress and, and the General Assembly. This is a photograph of a group of partners, including ourselves, uh, working with one of our congressional delegation, Abigail Spanberger, uh, on conservation and, and agricultural land preservation. Um, it's actually been a pretty good opportunity to have meetings where uh, you're all paying attention to the same same topic and, and nobody's walking in on you while you're having the meeting. So it's been uh, an interesting opportunity to do, do things a little differently and do them, do them even better. There's never been more awareness of the need to expand public access to open space and nature. Uh, we've seen a huge surge in the number of people who are visiting PEC sites like the Piedmont Memorial Overlook. Uh, this is a view from there. Um, the, the other public lands that we manage and, and the, um, the public land resources all through the region are, are being overused, if anything. And so the need for more, the need for more uh, trails, the need for more connectivity between where we live and where we recreate 
has never been more apparent. Uh, and that remains a big focus of what we do. But in the last year, what we've really learned about is the importance of our work on local food and the, the need for it to include a focus on food security. We see our role as acting as a catalyst between local producers and the regional and local food banks and food pantries uh, that, that have seen a huge surge in the uh, demand. And we're doing that in a lot of different ways. Uh, one was to capitalize on the investment we made in PEC's community farm at Roundabout Meadows. Um, we, last year, we tripled the production at the community farm, all of which goes to Loudon Hunger Relief. And I think in similar uh, circumstance to DC Central Kitchen, we, we had to modify the way we did uh, handle those, uh, that production to try to make it available as individual portions. Luckily, we were able to use volunteers and get hundreds of people involved, from thousands of volunteer hours. So this is a real community effort. Uh, and we're looking to further expand that effort uh, this year. The second thing we we're able to do is connect producers, local farmers uh, with the food pantries throughout our region. Uh, food security needs range from 15 to 25% uh, depending on the community. So there's need everywhere. Uh, Matt Coyle, our new staff person to work on this uh, program, you know, was very busy. Uh, he visited food banks and food producers all up and down the 29 corridor from, from Clark and, and Loudon all the way down to Albemarle. And what we found in particular was a concern was the shutdown of school and school nutrition programs uh, during the early stages of COVID, which had a, a very disruptive effect on local dairy farms. About 30 to 40% of their productions go, goes to the school lunch program. They had nowhere to take the milk. They're literally disposing of it rather than uh, having an alternative way to, to market it. We started raising money. We had a lot of help from a lot of partners, the PATH Foundation, lots of individual donors. And we were able to facilitate really the repackaging of, of that food, that, that uh, milk um, into more usable containers that the food pantries could, could then distribute it to the families that needed it. Uh, hugely successful in the sense of, of getting local production to people uh, where they were used to going and uh, that program continues probably into the summer. So what's the takeaway? Well, uh, the pandemic has re revealed very clearly uh, the problems with a over-reliance on national food chains. Um, we, we think of everything being on grocery store shelves and most of it is coming from centralized pr production and manufacturing sites. And when that chain broke down, uh, there was a real gap in, in, in the connection. So we've been working to redouble our efforts on, fo on focus on local systems, how to make them more sustainable, how to make them more resilient, how to better match what they're producing to local needs. Um, there's a lot of pieces to that. Um, we've been working you know, for years on sustainable practices. We've been working for years to connect people with local farms. Um, we've been trying to fix specific problems in the production uh, process. Right now we're focused on livestock uh, manufacture, you know, basically slaughter capacity so that there will be more available. Um, so the, the specific needs are still um, being identified and focused on. We hope to make investments that make a difference and uh, that's where we start connecting with DC Central Kitchen. When we look around for inspiration and encouragement, uh, we keep coming up with the inspirational transformative work that Mike Curtin has enabled as he, as he leads DC Central Kitchen. Mike grew up in Washington, DC. He's a graduate of the Gonzaga College High School, uh, which is right downtown near the um, Union Station. And he, he's also a, a fellow graduate of Williams College up in Bucolic Western Massachusetts, uh, where he was a classmate of mine and married another good friend and classmate, Maureen McDonald. Three kids, lives in Falls Church, uh, very much a part of our region, um, but also someone who came with a, a really interesting point of view. He's a religion major. He believes in, in, in service. He believes in transformational change. And he went from a career, in, uh, an early career in investing in emerging local food system, food industry, really restaurants and, 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 and the local food in industry and started to uh, work in DC Central Kitchen in 2004. Uh, and now he's brought those entrepreneurial skills uh, to DC Central Kitchen. 
the, you know, the mission of providing healthy meals to those most in need is still clearly a focus, but the goal is bigger. The goal is bigger. It's to get people better able to support themselves, their families, and their communities. And as a result, along the way, DC Central Kitchen has become a large, reliable purchaser from local food producers and regional farm auctions. They prepare food for thousands of families. They train and employ and find jobs in the food industry for, for dozens of, of, of folks. They're developing systems to deliver fresh food and produce to food deserts within the city, in the region. And they are all the time helping us better understand the most basic of human needs, the need for food, and how that can be a transformational process towards a more just and equitable society. So I'm really happy today to introduce you to Mike. Um, and I'm hoping that we'll end today with real inspiration on what we can do uh, to make the world a better place through food. So Mike. Thank you, Chris. Uh, that's an awesome um, introduction. Uh, and, and the way you said one of the things there about my, my career and investing in restaurants, is that, that made it sound a lot better than it was, I have to be honest with you. I, I'm a recovering restaurateur. Uh, I worked hard in restaurants uh, around the city and hotels for about 15, a little over 15 years, worked to owning my own um, th that I did in Falls Church from 98 to 2002, uh, a time that I say, say now was my first experience in the nonprofit sector, was <laughs> owning, owning and operating my own restaurant. Uh, but but I, I do want to say to, to Chris, um, he, he's way too kind. That I, I got here almost by accident. Uh, I did bring a different kind of perspective, and I think that's been helpful in the growth that we've had at the kitchen and what we've been able to do. But back at Williams College at Bucolic Western Mass, as Chris said, uh, I hope everyone that's associated with, with Piedmont Environmental Council understands that, that Chris really was a true visionary and back in the early and mid 80s was studying, majored in environmental science, environmental studies, something that most of us knew nothing about or certainly didn't understand. And I, I know for when I didn't take the time to understand. So it, it's been a, a joy and a pleasure to, to reconnect with Chris over the last few, several years and around this, this work in particular. And I'm really honored to be kicking off this keynote series. Uh, the Piedmont has played a huge role for me in this last year. I've spent a good bit of time in and around the Piedmont. Uh, particularly going down for hikes as I uh, uh, you know, stop at the Red Truck Bakery in Marshall for my uh, granola and whatever else they, they have on special. But uh, it's, it's been, uh, you know, I think we've all learned even more than we knew before how important this preserving this outdoor space and these communities and these ecosystems are for all of us. So let me, if I just share my screen now, Mark, I should be cool. Yep. Okay. So we, we got the good view? Yep, looks great. Right, okay. So uh, again, welcome everybody. Our thank you so much. It's, again, it, it's an honor to be here. Uh, what I wanna try to do today is, is, is talk about food systems as Chris was saying, but, but at a 30,000 foot level or maybe even higher um, and, and weave that into what we've done over the years at DC Central Kitchen because in, in many ways, uh, everything that we do is, is about food systems. Um, if you, you expand your view large enough. Um, but I, I think what we've been able to do is, is give people the flexibility and freedom to understand food systems in another way and to understand um, uh, how, how, how integral food is to economic development, growth, sustainability, uh, livability uh, for, for all of our communities. But before we get into that too deep, just real quick, um, we always want to know uh, where you know, where we've started. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so we want to talk about DC Central Kitchen. Uh, we use food as a tool to strengthen bodies, empower minds, and build communities. Um, and the most important word there is tool. Right, we, we, we know that, that food is not the answer, it's a means, not an end. Uh, and, and that's really how, how we can start to talk about um, why we do what we do before we even get to the what of what we do. So the kitchen is based on, on two principles that were uh, two ideas that um, 
came to our founder, Robert Egger, after I guess what you would describe as a, a unsatisfying, uh, confusing, frustrating volunteer experience, going out with a group of, of uh, new friends of his at a church where he had just joined because he was getting married, um, to hand out sandwiches and coffee to men and women living on the streets here in DC, something I'm sure many people in this uh, in this room have, have done. Um, and the two things that he came out of, of this experience were, one, is that food is not gonna end hunger. We are never, ever, ever going to feed our way out of hunger. Uh, hunger is just a symptom of a, a larger problem, um, just like uh, homelessness, um, incarceration, uh, to a certain extent, addiction, abuses, certain traumas um, that are a result of poverty which is a result of the structural racism and systematic, systemic economic inequality that have always existed in our country. And that's something that we have to acknowledge, recognize, and accept before we can move on and really talk about ending hunger. And the second principle or idea or pillar that the kitchen is based on is, and perhaps this one's a little more insidious, um, and this was what Robert recognizes somehow unintentionally, because all of the people that he'd been working with and, and went out on this, this volunteer mission to, to work with were, were good, well-intentioned people with love in their hearts. But somehow, um, this, this notion of charity had been turned so it was more about the redemption of the giver and not the liberation of the receiver. And so the kitchen then became a place where we have to focus on liberation, on opportunity, on freedom. Um, and, and, and recognize that we can use food to get there, but we're not going to feed our way to that liberation. Uh, and that's why we often say that we fight hunger differently. Uh, we want to look at the way what we do, not through the lens of food, but through the lens of opportunity. As, as Chris said many times, the lens of transform transformational change. Uh, and so that's why we have focused mostly on our culinary job training program. Uh, which works with, with men and women who have faced severe, significant barriers to employment, barriers like histories of incarceration, of addiction, uh, of abuse, of trafficking, of homelessness, or other traumas, to get them to a place of self-sufficiency and self-actualization, self-realization, so they can be that person that we all want to be, where they support themselves and they support their families. So as we were going about doing that, um, a reporter from the New York Times came down to, to D.C. to talk to Robert and ask about, learn about the kitchen. And as Robert started talking about the kitchen, the guy stopped him and said, I, I just don't get this. I, I'm not sure where, what, what, what's happening here. You're certainly not, you're not talking like a food bank person or a pantry person or, or, or a typical what I think of as a nonprofit person. You talk about business. Uh, you're talking about economic liberation and empowerment and opportunity. Uh, but you're not really a business either. What are you? And, and Robert said, thought for a second, and he said, I'm a righteous entrepreneur. And we sort of uh, liked that idea of a righteous entrepreneur. Robert introduced this before the idea of social enterprise or social entrepreneurship was actually a thing and something you studied in school and there are conferences and books and all sorts of uh, gatherings uh, and an industry around this. Uh, but you know, it, it's, it felt like it was something that described the work that we did. Uh, and this is how I want to talk about food systems through through this lens of a righteous entrepreneur, uh, but in the context of what we're facing today with COVID. Uh, a little history and a little uh, modern day piece of, of what that history has allowed us to do now to respond to this pandemic. Um, so as we, we, we you know, reveled in this idea of being a righteous entrepreneur, we, uh, a couple of years ago, we said, you know, if we're going to do this, we're going to talk about this, we should probably define this thing. Uh, and so we created eight rules for righteous entrepreneurs. Um, today, we're only going to have a chance to get through four of them. Um, and I'm trying to do my best to get through four of them. Um, and maybe we'll come back another time and, and, and do the other four. But we'll start with rule number one. It's okay to be a little antisocial uh, in service of your mission. So Right now, the, this story is 2006. Uh, DC Central Kitchen has been operating for about 17 years, uh, doing our, our meals to the shelters, doing training, 
uh, using a lot of leftover food that was going to be thrown away, secondhand reclaimed food, and doing doing a fine job and, and providing these meals for the city shelters for free. Uh, but the city kept asking us to do more, and, and they wanted us to do better and more protein and more fresh fruits and vegetables and more salads and more variety. And of course, we wanted to do that too, but we were struggling just to get by using the donated food that we could get. So we went to the city and we said, hey, uh, if we want to do better together, we're going to need you guys to invest some, and, and you folks to invest some money in this. What seemed to be an easy, a simple and straightforward proposition turned into about nine months of hearings and meetings and discussions until finally the city council said, yes, absolutely, we, we have some responsibility here. We're putting aside this amount of money to go to feed our shelters and we're giving it to this organization so they can then subgrant it out to the organizations that will do the feeding. And we said, oh, that's awesome, that's fantastic. And we walked over to this organization that we had worked with before and we said, here we are, we're ready to start. And they said, well, we can't just give you this money. It's over a million dollars. So the law says we have to put out a, a, a public, I have to have a public RFP process, full transparent uh, process to, to distribute this money, which we thought was absurd, given the fact that we had been doing this for free for 17 years, they were going to pay now a few pennies, and anyone could come and get this business. But being the good soldiers we were, we played along, we, we responded to the RFP, several more months went by, we were told we were awarded the RFP, the only thing now to do would be to um, sign a contract and, and be on our merry way and start getting paid. So it was right about this time of year, actually, that this was all coming to a head. And they said, we will have your contract for you on March 1st. And we said, great, you know, this is going on a year, but hey, it's been worth it. We're hanging on, we're, we're slugging it out every day, but we're gonna make it, uh, here we are. So March 1st rolled around, they said, well, it, uh, it, March 15th, uh, we promised by March 15th. Then it was April 1st, uh, then it was April 15th. And then when it got to be May 1st, we said, no, um, this is just wrong. Uh, if for a second, uh, you, the District of Columbia, believed that our work was valuable, if you valued our work, if you valued the men and women we were providing food for, if you valued the men and women who were doing this work, many of whom had lived in these shelters, if you understood the charity really isn't about just giving something left over and it's something nice if you can, what we were doing is true economic uh, uh, you know, uh, development work in creating better communities, creating better lives, creating better futures, making our city a more livable place. This is this is real dollars, not just something cute and nice and something that you can just sort of push aside and say, I'll get to it when I get to it. We said no. So here comes the antisocial part. So Robert Egger, who's the uh, the older gentleman there standing next to me, this is me and Robert actually just a couple of years ago out on the road at a conference where we, we got to do a gig together, which was, which was fantastic. Um, but we said, we are going to do something that most nonprofits think they either can't or shouldn't do. We're going to go on strike. Uh, and until we get that contract, we are not going to deliver meals to the shelters, not because we want this money necessarily, but because we have to change this system that people need to understand that the food that we are providing, the food that we are seeking to get is, is transformational and will, 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 will then allow jobs and families uh, and, and savings and again, an economic development. Uh, so as you can imagine, the city scrambled. We were in the Washington Post on Pozo Namdi show. All, all sorts of press. Um, and to, to put a fine point on this, and this is probably why we, one of the reasons we got the press, um, and to emphasize that it wasn't just about the kitchen, it was really about this larger idea, um, Robert and I said, we're not going to eat either. And so that began what, what ended up being an eight-day hunger strike. Um, and hunger strike work. And we embarrassed, in essence, the city into doing what they said they were going to do. Um, it was a transformational time for me personally. Um, that has given the work that I do now at the kitchen a lot more meaning um, for, for me. Um, but ultimately what it, what it did is put us in a place where we were getting uh, revenue in a way that we had never imagined before um, that was of course in service with our mission, mission, but we had to be a little antisocial to get there. Uh, which brings us to rule number two. Maintain a, a sense of productive impatience. Uh, so here we are, we're getting revenue that we never had before. This is amazing. And we could have just sort of said, ah, this is great. Let's sit back and enjoy this for a little bit uh, and just order from the, the national mainline wholesalers like everyone else does, or let's really push forward and do something different by the way that we're doing our business, by the way that we're buying. So we reached out 
to uh, actually this, the first folks we really started talking to seriously were the folks at the Shenandoah Valley Produce Auction. And that was by happenstance. I ran into a guy who worked for VDAX at a restaurant association uh, happy hour. Uh, and we started talking about this crazy idea that I had. And he said, I got to introduce you to someone. And a week later, I was down in Dayton, Virginia at the Shenandoah Valley Produce Auction, talking to folks there about how I wanted to buy from them. But I also, but I really wanted to buy their, their cosmetically or aesthetically challenged product uh, that really didn't have a lot of commercial value, bring it back to, to DC and put it into our food. So as you can imagine, I got a lot of vacants, very nice you know, smiles and nods, but I don't think there was a lot of trust there until we paid our first check, uh, our first bill. And then all of a sudden, um, there, there was an amazing amount of trust. Uh, and this was an incredible relationship. And, and uh, this, I have to say, is one of my favorite pictures of all times. On the right-hand side of the slide is, or this is the, 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 the auction at, at Dayton. Uh, those buggies are what a lot of the growers bring their product to the auction in. This is one of our old vehicles when we started going down there, loading stuff up. Uh, you know, we moved to 24-foot trucks. Uh, and quickly became the largest producer of product uh, from the Shenandoah Valley Produce Auction. And interestingly, this is when I ran into uh, Chris Miller one, uh, I think it was a December evening. We were probably both trying to cram in some last minute holiday shopping out in Clarendon. And I told him we were doing this. Uh, or this, These were some ideas I had. And he said, oh, you got to talk to Kristen Pauly at, at Prince Charitable Trust. You got to talk to Julia Bear Cooper. Uh, about the work you're doing. And we had certainly worked with those work with, with Kristen and Julia, uh, but this put it, us into a whole different place. And I think really redefined um, the way we were going to fit into this world of food system uh, and the way and what how we were going to define our work going forward. We're moving from what was more of a, a social service charity, uh, pro using leftover food, producing some meals and training folks to really a social enterprise, a righteous enterprise business that was creating um, economic development um, and, and communities. So 2007, we're, we're, we're getting all this product in. Um, we started extra shifts, so we'd be able to hire more graduates from our training program, promote graduates uh, who had been there to manage those shifts, engage more volunteers. We're vacuum sealing, freezing our product to put into our meals. Everything's going great. And then 2008, the recession. Nonprofits start to close, people are cutting back, people are terrified, philanthropy dries up, what are we gonna do? Uh, so when we took stock of the situation, we said, actually, we're gonna have to do probably what might be the opposite of what a smart person might do, and that's go bigger. Actually, we had to figure out a way to expand our mission footprint, but do it without relying on philanthropy and do it in a way that was not only sustainable, but scalable. And what ultimately we settled on was school food. Um, I happen to know the guy uh, who started the Washington Jesuit, Cad Jesuit Academy. As Chris mentioned, I, I'm fortunate enough to go to Gonzaga, so I'm part of this, this Jesuit Irish Catholic mafia here that exists in Washington, as was Billy Whitaker, who started WJA. And so we met as, as most of these mafia meetings happen at the Dubliner and uh, had a hamburger and an iced tea and, and worked this whole thing out. Um, we put our graduates at, in their school. This, this happens to be a tuition-free private school for at-risk middle school boys. It operates 11 months out of the year, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And so we were able to do three meals a day, uh, fresh fruit and salad bars, soup bar, nutrition education classes. And, and our folks at the school really became much more than just vendors, but they became part of the school and really became role models and mentors to these young boys, uh, many of whom were facing the same kind of questions and crossroads uh, and obstacles and hurdles uh, as our folks had when they were younger. So it was really a powerful opportunity for us uh, to expand the mission, but also to start using a lot of this beautiful food we were getting from the local farms in, in an urban setting, uh, providing food for, for these kids that they'd never seen this kind of food before. Um, so as, as bad as 2008 started with the recession, it ended in a pretty cool way with President Obama being elected and Mrs. Obama coming into the White House. Um, we, 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 we feel there's a chance uh, that when she came in, she looked around and said, so, you know, I have to pick something for my, my legacy as first lady. What am I going to do? And she looked around and said, look, look what's happening over at DC Central Kitchen. Those guys, they're working with local farms and sustainability. They've made the connection with nutrition and education uh, and bringing this kind of healthy, fresh food, scratch cooked food into schools. I'm going to do that. So, so we don't know for sure if that's the case. Uh, but we do know that she's never said it wasn't the way it happened. So we're just going to go with it for now. She and her husband and the girls have been down here twice. They loved it. 
So I, I feel pretty comfortable um, saying that. But what I know for sure uh, is that her work inspired a lot of school districts, including Washington, D.C., to hire a new food service director to upgrade their, to look at their, 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 their food program, upgrade it. We were able to grab onto him, take him up to the Washington Jesuit Academy and said, hey, look what's possible. Carve us out a few schools and let us do a pilot with locally sourced scratch cook school food and see what we can do. Uh, and uh, so they, they created a re request for proposal, a monster request for proposal. We responded to that. Uh, we're chosen for that first contract uh, in 2010. Uh, that started as a $1.4 million contract. Uh, it, it was modified a couple of times from 1.8 into 3 million. And the last time we, re we uh, redid it, it was 2015, the $5 million or 15 million or $5 million contract. Uh, and we are hoping later this year uh, to at least double that number. Uh, of course, the, the, the revenue is, is wildly important as is what that means is what we're going to be purchasing, but it means jobs. Um, right now, that's about 65 jobs, well-paying, above the living wage job, 100% healthcare job, contribution to 401k job. Uh, and you can't really talk about food systems without talking about job systems and daycare systems and healthcare systems. Uh, and, and, and the kind of jobs that we offer and create are just as important or more, way more important than the fact that we're offering jobs. Uh, we also hope to, to, to model the, the kind of employer we want others in the food service industry to be. Uh, so we're hoping we'll be able to increase that. Um, so all of these things really have come out of, this, of that strike back in 2006, that antisocial moment when we said no. Uh, and then when we got what we were after, we said, how can we use this power to change the way people are thinking about school food, about food in shelters, about where we're buying this food, about what local food can be, about who can have access to it, who can use it, who can eat it, who can make it. Uh, and this has prepared us quite well uh, to, to end up to the place where we were, we are now in, in COVID. Um, and this is, this is our COVID dashboard. If you go to our website, you can see this. It's updated every week. Uh, this area I have circled here. Uh, this is how much we have spent as of, I think, um, the 29th. Is that yesterday? Today? Yesterday? Um, almost $1.8 million, uh, in the last 12 months or, or, or so, um, from local farms to, for our COVID response. Uh, and to put that in context, the 12 months prior to last March, we had spent $330,000. This is the Shenandoah Valley Produce Auction again. Um, and actually, I'm sorry, I didn't update that number, but the, the number you saw back here is, is, the, is the, 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 the real one, $1.8 million uh, in local farms. Uh, so I just wanted to hit these re real quick, just a couple, and just show the growth. And, and, and when you talk about systems, um, you know, keep in mind that what we're doing here in this basement of this god awful teeny shelter, one program in Washington, D.C., uh, the kind of, of volume that we're talking about, just imagine if we can get more people to think bigger about what the possibilities are, the, the economic impact that we can have is just immense. So, this one Kilmer Farm, which is in Inwood, West Virginia, uh, 12 prior year, $118,000 almost $600,000 over the last 12 months. Uh, Mox Greenhouse in Berkeley Springs, uh, about, from about 5,000 to a quarter of a million dollars this last month. Uh, we've also increased our work with uh, Food Hubs, the local Food Hub, which is out of Charlottesville and 4P Foods, a local group um, who, as I'm sure everyone knows, have been working to, to uh, you know, change, you know, inspire this kind of transformational change in food systems here for years. Um, we worked with the folks at, in Charlottesville at the local food hub for a long time as well. Um, as they've merged, um, our pre-COVID spend was about 33000 The last 12 months, it's been uh, almost $285,000. Uh, what's also wonderful about the work with, with these food hubs in particular, as well as the next one I'm going to mention real quickly, is that we've um, been able to uh, work closely with uh, uh, farms, BIPOC farms, Latinx farms, Black farmers, other farmers of color uh, to really step in where a lot of the, the institutional partners and farmers markets that they've been working with for years have dried up or, or has been significantly uh, decreased because of COVID. So it's Flores Farm in, in Hague, Virginia, almost $47,000 over the last uh, few weeks, 13,000 with the Goldman Farm, it's the fifth generation uh, black owned farm um, in Cullen, Virginia. Um, a couple farms in, in, in the Piedmont region, uh, Fresh H2O, 
and super farms, super our superfood farms in Remington. It's, it's owned by an Egyptian family that immigrated here about 20 years ago. Um, they started the farm in, in 2012. This is their son, the, the Raymond, who is, has, is the won the either the prize or the the booby prize of being the best English speaker. So he's the one who does all their sales and marketing and, and deals with the the reps when all they're doing doing the ordering. Uh, and about 32,000 combined um, there. We've also uh, worked a lot with our, our friends at Common Market. I was on the board of this organization for about eight years. They're based in Philadelphia. Um, their mission is to work with farmers of color. Um, they've expanded to the mid-Atlantic region as well as to Atlanta and to, uh, to Texas or to Georgia and Texas. Um, and uh, we've uh, increased our spend with them almost to above a, a, a quarter of a million dollars as well. Uh, and here are just a couple of the farms, um, uh, Red Hill Farm and Dusty Lane Farm. Red, Red Hill is in Ashton, Pennsylvania, but it's owned by the Sisters of St. Francis in Philadelphia. Uh, so we, we, we've really, uh, and then the Dusty Hill is an eighth generation uh, family farm in New Jersey. Uh, so we're really, you know, just the, the economic ripples um, that go out are, are immense from, from all, all from this antisocial moment and this focus on being a righteous entrepreneur. Uh, Dreaming Out Loud, which is an organization based here in Ward 8, Chris Bradshaw, I'm sure many of you know of him and his work. Uh, he started out doing farmer's market and creating snap access in farmer's market. He's expanded to food production and running an um, entrepreneurial training program for young black food entrepreneurs. Um, we will be at, we've worked very, very closely with them, um, not just on buying um, greens from their farmers over COVID, but have helped them to get funding from some of our larger national funders um, to the tune of over $500,000 over the last 12 months. And they will be also working with us in our new space that I'll talk to you at the, at the very end here. Uh, rule number four, be proactively responsive. Uh, what we're always, always looking forward, always thinking about what's the next, where, where is the issue that, that um, you know, we, we could put off till tomorrow, what we think might be too hard, what we wanna say, maybe someone else will do it. Uh, we wanna get out there, see this problem, get out in front of it and do it. Um, one of the problems when we talk about food systems, food access, food justice, food equity, we always have to talk about food deserts um, or food apartheid areas more appropriately. Um, even in a city of the tremendous wealth and of African-American wealth, the DC is, 11% of our city has been declared a food desert um, and because of the lack of access to, to grocery stores. So these dots represent the grocery stores in the District of Columbia. Wards one through six on the left-hand side of the map, or we say west of the Anacostia River, there are 71 full grocery stores. In Ward six, which abuts both Ward eight and Ward seven, uh, there's 14 full service grocery stores and 82,000 residents. So about one for every 6,000 residents. East of the Anacostia, our most economically marginalized and forgotten part of the city, three full, re full service grocery stores for 150,000 residents, one for every 50,000 people. That's outrageous. Uh, so in, in 2011, we started a program called Healthy Corners where we, we um, matched, we knew there was a, a, a demand uh, of course, there's supply, but we were able to bridge the distribution gap because we had trucks. We had people we wanted to employ um, to, to an access to to these areas. Uh, so we, we did whole food, fresh fruits and vegetables, and then we started cut fresh fruits and vegetables, uh, delivering them to uh, and providing refrigeration, marketing, point of sale system, inventory control, all sorts of help for the mark for the retailer. So they were not taking a financial risk. Um, and able and 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 have now seen the, the financial value as their sales have increased and they've increased other healthy uh, food options into what we call healthy corners or healthy healthy corners corners or healthy corners corners. So so it's around our refrigerators there, there's there's fresh grains and there's uh, whole wheat pastas and there's yogurts and there's skim milk and, and things that, that, that the, these retailers never imagined doing because mostly because people said, well, you know, folks in those neighborhoods, they, won't, they don't want fresh fruits and vegetables. They'll never buy fresh fruits and vegetables. Well, if they're not there to buy, those people will be right 100% of the time. Um, but what we've seen over the last 10 years and certainly during COVID is that everyone will buy those project, products if they're there uh, and in COVID, we've, we've delivered over uh, almost 350,000 units 
of these cut fruits and vegetables and, and whole fruits and vegetables to corner stores. Uh, and we found if they're if they're delivered, um, if they're if the food is good, if they're packaged uh, with love and dignity and respect, and they're priced uh, reasonably, uh, people will indeed buy them. Um, what we've also seen, I'm sorry about, uh, is in addition to the, the uh, working with the, the, the corner stores, we've, we've also seen the, the hunger gap, the food insecurity gap in DC grow. Um, there are some estimates, the DC Food Policy Council said that the hunger, food insecurity is gonna grow in DC by 60% um, this year. Uh, most of that food insecurity is again in Ward 7 and 8, um, where the population is overwhelmingly African-American. Um, and th this, the, the food insecurity overwhelmingly affects kids. So uh, one of the programs that we started during COVID, again, positioned because of our work with local farmers, is doing something that we never imagined doing, we never really wanted to do, but delivering produce bags and boxes. Um, we've now delivered over 2.2 million pounds of these bags and boxes um, throughout the city at almost 200 different distribution points within schools, community center, faith-based churches. We also have vans uh, that are just going around um, setting up tables in different areas. Uh, we have two food trucks that are on order now. So by the summer, we'll be able to do uh, food trucks handing out free summer meals around the city. Um, all again, uh, but rethinking um, the food systems as they exist and what, what is needed to, to meet the needs that, ex that are today in the community because of, of COVID. Um, and our last, our last rule is rule six, beware the folly of scale. So uh, I, I've said scale a few times. Um, I know sometimes this can be a bit hypocritical of me when I, when I talk about this because I, I talk about expanding and growing and I wanna do that, but I wanna do it for the right reason. Um, so we, we had a program called the Campus Kitchens Project. Uh, where we took our model and put it on, on campuses at universities and colleges across the country um, so that it was owned by those schools and those students and not us. So we could expand our ideas, but not necessarily have to build a new place. Uh, expand, you take our values and, 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 and expand those and scale those in a way that would have repercussions across the country. Uh, a few years ago, we actually spun this off. We realized we were going in sort of a different direction. Uh, and we spun this off to a group called the Food Recovery Network that was run by folks that were more closely aligned to campuses and students, and it's flourished. Um, so that's scaling, but not with uh, ego or ownership involved. Um, and exactly it, with that spirit in mind, one of the things I'm most proud of that we've done over the last 12 months, um, as we've seen an overwhelming uh, influx of funding from the community to, to meet the, the needs uh, that, that exist in terms of hunger is our commitment to, to um, put that money back out in the community. So I know that I, I want to believe, and I do believe that the trust we've earned because of our work has been efficient, effective, transparent over the last three decades, uh, that we've, we've been the recipient of this. But I also know we've seen a lot of new donors. And I know people just Google uh, food, food insecurity in DC, hunger in Washington, and came up with DC Central Kitchen. So we wanted to make sure that we were honoring the, 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 the intentions of those donors uh, and have now subgranted uh, almost $500,000 to other small organizations working with mutual aid networks, um, other groups that are doing this hard work on the ground, um, as well as working with some of the restaurant partners that have supported us, caterers that have supported us creating fee-for-service contracts with, with nonprofits that had supported us, uh, just so they could not only survive now, but to, so they would hopefully come out stronger because uh, we're going to pivot back to our training work and get going back to doing different things. And, and if these groups aren't primed and ready to, to continue to meet this need, which is going to exist long after we all have vaccines, um, we are going to be in a world of hurt. Uh, so this investment that we're making today, uh, I think investing smartly in ideas um, and, and systems, transformational systems, is why we can we have hope for the future um, when we say we wanna to continue to fight hunger differently. So I, I would, I talked to Chris, I'm gonna do real quick um, to, to talk three seconds about the future. We have two amazingly cool things coming up 
uh, again, that are going to be transformational, I think. This is the new MLK library uh, right down in Penn Quarter. That red circle in the bottom is where we are going to operate a cafe on the first floor, um, right off the main reading room, right off that, that the area, the grand foyer where the, the, the mural is of Dr. King. And to be in a space that memorializes the vision, the, the, the legacy of Dr. King's um, um, mission of economic inclusion and equality is going to be really, really special. And it's going to be even more special because we are going to name it Marianne after our long time, my dear, dear friend, Marianne Ali, who was here for 20 years. Um, and I get emotional every time I think about this, um, who died through past three years ago after battling pancreatic cancer. Uh, prior to her coming here, she battled uh, a heroin and crack habit for 20 years, got clean through cooking, through food, uh, and worked with us and changed lives in ways that can't even imagine. Um, so she will be honored and forever uh, in, embedded in that in Dr. King's legacy and message. And as I briefly mentioned, we are going to be moving our headquarters to Buzzard Point, right there where that star is at the tip of Washington, D.C., Ward 6, where Anacostia and the Potomac River come together into this gorgeous mixed-use uh, uh, building. Uh, we will be the largest retail tenant with 35,000 square feet on the first and second floors. Uh, it'll be a place where our students can come and and, and um, when we say after you've been in a, in, a, in a small cinder block cell for a good part of your life or been having lived in an institutional life and we haven't come to this shelter, it's not really much of an upgrade. But now we can say come to this place that is filled with love and dignity and respect uh, and, and honor for the work that you're doing, the transformation that you are making, the commitment that you're making to change. Uh, so it, it's all, all part of the future, all part of being uh, a righteous entrepreneur and all part of thinking uh, about fighting hunger differently. Mike, that was amazing. I just want to thank you so much for, for that, that incredible uh, perspective. Um, we honor what you're doing and we're proud to be, be friends and, and proud to be partners. Um, just, just an incredible vision and we can't wait to help support you moving forward. There are a lot of questions. Um, I'm okay. going to lead off with one, which is, which is, um, uh, and driving into, I think our shared experience, part of your story, which is early on, you were confronted by, with procurement guidelines, and uh, you know we've been working for a while to try to to get local schools and, and institutions to be bigger purchasers locally, and sort of hit that wall a number of times. Um, other than perseverance and, and being being willing to be to act out, act up. Any other thoughts on how how we can make that part of the the new politics, new policies of the of the future. Well, you, you know, I was actually, Chris, uh, just before th this uh, talk, I, I, I was looking at a, a letter that um, a trade group is sending to Secretary Vilsack. Uh, and, and I do feel, uh, and Secretary Vilsack, I, I know there's been some, there's a bit of controversy around his nomination, renomination again, but I think we have an opportunity with someone who, who he's, a, he's a good guy, you know, and I, I, I've enjoyed, I've enjoyed working with him. Um, and I think he understands the system. And I'd like to think that we have an opportunity now for him to really take a big swing at something. And these procurement guidelines you're talking about are, are, are just that. I mean, you know, we, we are fortunate in our school work that we are working in a small part of a small district. So if we were doing the whole district, we would be really hamstrung by a lot of these national procurement rules and the, the, you know, the, the commodity purchasing re agree, acquire, um, requirements. Uh, we, we are not bound by those. So I get we have an advantage, uh, but I, I think trying to get past those and, and, and you know, it's getting the USDA to, you know, the USDA sort of fighting against itself uh, and, and see if we can get, you know, I don't want to say the good and bad USDA because they're both, they're good sides to both, I guess. But uh, we, somehow we've got to get Vilsack to, uh, to, 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 to see things uh, more clearly, uh, but also more minutely. And, and you know, we, we have to sometimes, you know, we really need to see the trees and not the forest. And, and this is what we need him to get to see. Perfect. You've got a question from Catherine about the relationship with the uh, Capital Area Food Bank. Can you address that? Sure. So I don't know who Catherine is, and I don't, this might be a trap or a trick, que trick question because it, it's a well known fact that uh, Robert Edgar, our founder, and Lynn Brantley, the founder of the Capital Area Food Bank, loathed each other. Um, but we, given that, uh, we do a tremendous amount of work with the food bank. Uh, they are a huge supplier, of, a source of food for us. Uh, I gotta, 
somehow I, I've, I've popped back on the screen. I hate looking at myself, when it, but uh, uh, so we, we've done a, a, a ton of work for them. We, we actually, when um, uh, they had to stop money of their program or some of their programming, um, when COVID hit, we were able to, to pick up some of those um, sites or uh, programs. Um, you know, they, they remain an incredibly uh, close friend and ally. Um, you know, Radha Muthai over there, who's the relatively new CEO, and I talk on a regular basis. Um, and, and I want to be careful. You know, when, when I say things like, uh, you know, feeding, handing out food is not the answer. Building bigger food banks is not the answer. That is true. That doesn't mean that it's not part of the answer. Right. So the danger and this is this is the danger when, when people talk about big hunger is that we say, OK, I write a check to, to the Feeding America or the food bank and, and I'm done and it's over. And as long as we give out free food, it's, it, it, we're going to be OK. We won't. We're not going to be OK. So we have to admit that and understand that and, and work you know, again, as, as Chris keeps saying, um, it, for transformational change in the system. But 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 they are absolutely a, a needed player. Marco, you've got some questions that you've teed up, so I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, uh, so let's see here. One is, um, I guess Mike wanted you to talk a little bit more. You, you mentioned uh, the huge increase in, in producing local, um, in buying local, local food from local farms. Um, talk a little bit more about, uh, you know, why that happened, uh, you know, why during COVID, uh, what changed? Sure. So one one of the biggest things was the the produce bags that I mentioned um, that that we had never done. Um, you know that just wasn't our shtick. There were a lot of other organizations that were doing that, and that was fine. Um, but when it, it became apparent that the organizations that were doing that didn't have the capacity to meet the need that was out there, that's when we stepped in, and we went from you know like a hundred bags a week to now doing close to six thousand bags a week still. Um, and we, we're we're guaranteed we're going to be doing that at least through the summer. I, I don't know how much longer than that, but at least through the summer. So, you know, that that's, um, oh boy, math. Um, like, so like 60,000 pounds a week, I think, something like that. Um, so, so, so that's a, a pretty uh, a good amount right there. Uh, I think, I would like to think, and, and, and I get sort of the other side to this question is like, okay, you know, you know, half a million dollars in local purchasing ain't going to look so good anymore, right? And so, like, we can't go back is, is, is what I'm sort of sensing is part of behind the question. And I feel the same way. Uh, but part of this also goes to Chris's question, our, our comment about the, 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 the requirements for school food is not as easily met sometimes with the local uh, production, with the local purchasing, um, because of the you know the very specific guidelines that exist around some of the the products that have to appear on that menu, uh, so so we are talking about it now about especially as we look to what the production line is going to look like in the new space, how we're going to be able to not only maintain that level but but continue to increase it even when we get away from the um, the produce bags. Great, and and this, I guess sort of a related question, but but a bit broader. Um, what do you think the long-term impact of, of COVID uh, on our food systems, not just only in work you work, but you work in this space, so maybe you've heard what others have to say as well. Sure. Well, I, I think there, there's a lot of different ways to look at this. Um, so as, as I mentioned briefly, you know, the, 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 the huge increase that we've seen in food insecurity, food insecure households, is not going to end with vaccines. Like that, all of a sudden we don't snap back. You know, we can stop wearing masks maybe at some point, go to a concert, go to a Nats game, but that doesn't mean people are still, you know, people who lost their jobs, they don't get their jobs back when they get their second vaccine, right? That, that is not happening. Restaurants, uh, the, the, the folks that have been in hospitality uh, are not going back, uh, or at least for a while and to, to, to a much lesser degree than they do. Uh, so there is still gonna be this incredible pressure on, on the nonprofit organizations to fill these gaps. Uh, and I think what we're all scared about in the, in the sector is, is the, you know, is the donor fatigue, is, is the, the philanthropic uh, will it, that has been staggering, as I said, and humbling. Uh, how long is that gonna last? How long can that last? Uh, so that's, that's a really scary thing to think about. Um, uh, I, I will say, however, on the other side, 
that that this that the pandemic has shown this this blinding light on the inequality and inequity that exists in our country, especially in terms of food access. Uh, you know who who is getting hurt the most? They're black and brown communities. Uh, they're the the they're individuals and households and children that can afford it the least. Uh, and 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 that combined with this racial awakening um, and reckoning that we're dealing with now, especially as as, as the 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 trial of, of the the officer who, who murdered George Floyd is is ongoing. Um, we we are we are we are at least as a country to a certain degree more willing to have a discussion about why, right? Why why, why in the richest country in the world uh, are we even having? Why is this a topic? You know, I mean, really, this is where we are. And and to think, you know, at the beginning, just just 14, 15 years ago, DC Central Kitchen was held out as this example of. If, if we we can feed poor people leftover food, that's the answer. That that's what we've got as as a country. That's that's outrageous. Uh, so so now that there's more, hopefully people are now listening a little more, willing to to to. to you know, I, I have friends who, who I've said for years, this isn't about food. You know, this is about empowerment. This is about opportunity. And they're like, oh, so this is what you were talking about. I'm like, yes, this is what we're talking about. So hopefully that's the other side that'll that'll keep us going. Um, and and keep the government, as Chris and I were just discussing a second ago, open to thinking more broadly about some of these possibilities and supporting some of these local food systems. I mean, the, the food is out there. I mean, you know, you know, again, if one small group in the basement of a crumbling homeless shelter can spend one point eight million dollars uh, just to just to do a couple of small programs. Just imagine if we harness that that idea and, and expanded that. That would be amazing. Great, thanks. Um, There's so many ahead, questions, Mike. I'm going to give you an easy one, just so Margaret <laughs> can get organized. Someone asked uh, what what Williams College is doing to promote this this uh, this, this incredible collaboration between alumni. <laughs> well, I, I I have Maud Maud dialed in, didn't she? Isn't she on here? <laughs> you know, Mike Mike is is. Um, is a hero at, at Williams College. He, he won a bicentennial medal, which is sort of the Medal of Honor for alumni for his work. And and the, the college is very supportive. There are other people in the food food supply uh, and agricultural industry. Um, and I don't know, Mike, if you have others you want to mention, but there, there are folks who really do care about this. And, and I think Williams Center for Environmental Studies has always felt that yeah. Food systems was part of that larger sustainability model, um, so they've been preaching the gospel since 1969, and and uh, I think you're seeing some of the fruits of that. That yeah, and I think Williams is a great example of a of a self-operated food service uh, program that that really relies heavily on on local product and the farms up in the Berkshires, and they've made it part of the curriculum. I, I've been I've marveled at the involvement of the students. Uh, you know, I, as I talked about the Campus Kitchens project for years, I, I kept trying to get a Campus Kitchen started up there, but they already had, they were already doing stuff like that, so they didn't need me. So that, that was horrible. Uh, yeah, but there we had the log lunch, remember? So the, yeah, so the yeah. Well studies would host a community lunch every every week with good speakers, but all the food was local, organic. Yeah. So it was good. Yeah, like like my friend Chris, well ahead of our time. I I, I was down at the rugby field drinking beer. Chris was doing the good things up at the lobby. They're both. They're both. <laughs> I never. I wasn't that clever. <laughs> Marco, you've got more questions. I know. I do. I know it's it is three thirty one. Um, but I think we'll um, you know, most of you have, have stayed on, so I think we can go for a few more minutes. Um, if, if as long as that's all right with with Mike and Chris. Um. It's just a slightly different question, uh, which is just in a basic one, but for Chris, how does land conservation tie into food security? Well, that's a fair question. It's, uh, it's asked a lot and, and the answer is rather direct. Um, most of the land we're protecting has either been a farm or is currently in some form of food production. And so, you know, we see the two missions being very closely related. Um, the focus for many years was on conserving land from development, but increasingly our, our interest in is in, in land management and, and how to get landowners to think about what they're producing, who they're producing it for, um, how to do it in the most sustainable fashion possible. And uh, the, 
the hope is that that connection starts to generate an economic return for the producers. The, you know, the, the exciting thing about creating the, an identity for local food is that it starts to become a preference. And if it becomes a preference, then, then the return to the producers is strong enough that they're encouraged to do more. I mean, that's the theory. I think there are good signs of that happening. Um, Matt Coyle is on, he, he's, he's working on our Bry Fresh by Local Guide right now. Uh, very exciting this year. We're, we're going to do a, about a 300,000 household mailing, uh, which lists all of the local producers within you know reasonable, reasonable distance from the residents of the Piedmont. We'd love to expand that that to Northern Virginia to DC, so people had a better awareness of where they can buy directly from producers and and su support the ones that are growing food the way you want them to. Um, farmers markets are a piece of that, but uh, the best thing for a farmer is for you to buy it directly from him so that they get the maximum amount of the return. And, and I think this is investment we've made over, over more than a decade. It's like Mike, we, we work at the daily increment as well as the transform transformative idea. And I think that that type of investment re really makes a difference. So, you know, bottom line, conservation is part of a larger process of building sustainable processes and sustainable communities. And, and we think they go together. Uh, if you have a stable land base, it's a lot easier to invest in the sustainable systems that we're all looking for. Yeah. I, I think two things real quick, uh, Marco, if I could, Chris, um, another, another phrase that we use often here is relentless incrementalism. Just like you, you said, Chris, and, and that, that's what we are. Like we're, we're, we're not going to end hunger, right? We're not. But if, but if every day we can do a little more and push people a little further to think a little differently, open their minds, that's when we get that larger uh, you know, transformational change. Uh, but I think one of the things you said, Chris, was really important, having the growers like focus on who they're and what they're growing for. A lot of those farms that I mentioned, and there are, there are many others, uh, have specific patches of, of land, acres, that they grow for us, specific crops that they know when they put in the ground, they have a buyer for. Uh, and, and so we can move around uh, and, and some of the farms that we've worked with, it's allowed them to use some of their other land to sell, say, to, to Whole Foods. Uh, and they can, you know, I'm happy to have them charge them a little more. You know, that's great. If, if we can be that sort of that fulcrum that allows that use of that land to get back into production, you know, that's a powerful kind of catalyst. We're not going to, you know, we're, we're not going to be able to to compete in terms of um, econ real economic impact with a Whole Foods or some of these larger uh, outlets, but if we can sort of push someone to get to that next level, that's 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 important as well. Although Mike, you are going to get Jeff Bezos, who's now a resident, to to buy locally. That would help a lot. <laughs> I'm, I'm on it. Be a big local purchaser. There's a there's a quick question I can answer. I think directly, which is you know how much more are we going to try to do it. Uh, the community farm at Roundabout Meadows this year. We did a big jump last year. We almost tripled production. Uh, we're trying to add another 25% on top of that this year. Um, a lot of this is based on incredible volunteers who, who understand that they're part of a, a system and that they're providing uh, a hugely important piece of, of, of labor, but also um, becoming ambassadors for, for a much broader effort. And uh, we, we hope we can meet that that goal. Uh, it's a, it is, of course, climate dependent. So, you know, you, get, you always have your fingers crossed. But we're making investments uh, around three things this year. One is coal storage. That, that extends the, 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 the shelf life of, of fresh produce considerably to be able to, to do cold storage on site. And so that's uh, something we added this spring. Uh, we are um, uh, adding some protein. Um, we're bringing chickens on site. They're, they're good pest control devices, but they're also uh, a source of badly needed eggs. So if you ask food pantries what they need the most, it's protein, milk, and eggs. And, and, and you know, you get a lot of dry goods that need eggs and milk, and they don't have that. That, that doesn't work so well for the, for the families that need it. And then we're bringing in pigs who are going to be committed to the, pr the preparation of our new orchard, which will expand the produce into some fruit. Uh, Dana Melby, who's our, our, our farmer, uh, is, is married into a great orchardist family and is also an, an amazing horticulturalist. So she's already propagating plants to, to put in the orchard. The pigs will help uh, prepare by, by uh, basically taking the ground cover and, and digging it into the ground for us. So it's very, uh, very uh, sustainable way of improving soils. Um, so, so 
So big plans for the community farm, come out and volunteer. Uh, we already started. It's a, it's a really great educational opportunity, but it's also one of those few things you can do where a couple of hours makes a huge difference in terms of our outcomes. Great, thanks, Chris. So I think I have one small question uh, that was asked here in the chat uh, for for Mike, which is, would you be willing to do a part two of this? Uh, because, uh, and this question comes from one of our partners at, uh, at one of the, the food pantries in Fauquier County and um, just very excited about this presentation and hearing about your four rules and the way you've thought about this. So um, it, it's sort of a question, but I know you you talk yeah. a lot, Mike, and thank you. <laughs> well I don't, I, so when you said you talk a lot, that could be a good thing or a bad thing. No, right? it's so, great. Uh, uh, okay, so, so of course, yes. As I said, I, I, I love I love what we do. Uh, I love what we've been able to do because of partners. Uh, I, I love to see lives change and possibilities, explore those things. So I, absolutely, it's one of the things that the kitchen is all about. There's no point in keeping what we have without you know sharing it is is what we need to do. So. Again, we don't have the answers. We have a lot of experience. I'm always, always willing to do it. And I can't wait till we can actually do it in person so I can actually hear people at least groaning or maybe chuckling once in a while. But it, this, <laughs> this, in this environment, it just it just kills me. So I gotta, uh, make, I gotta make a pitch for Mike. The, the, one of the best events that, that occurs annually is, is DC Central Kitchen's big, big annual event. Um, and I guess it was a cap, capital food fight is what you call it. And, capital food fight, November 10th. So it, it was not able to be in, be be live last year because of COVID. But uh, make plans to go November tenth. Uh, where's it going to be at the the? Uh, it, if if, it, if it's live and we're hoping it's going to be, we're going to be right on that cusp. I have a feeling it'll be at the Anthem on the Wharf on Wednesday, November tenth. The eleventh is Veterans Day. It's a holiday. Take it off. Stay late. Or, you know, come early. Stay late. It's Chris is right. It's it's an awesome fun event. I hope I hope you'll you'll join me in, in thanking Mike. If you can send a contribution to DC Central Kitchen, I, I would really ask you to sort of honor his his contributions to our, our whole region and to both the conservation and, and sustainable farm work that's going on in the countryside and an important work of figuring out how to do a better job of getting that food to the people who need it the most. Uh, DC Central Kitchen, we'll we'll post this as part of our, our follow-up email, but you can find them. They're they're well well advertised. They do great work every day. Uh, Mike is someone who puts the time in. Um, he went in every day during COVID, which is which is courageous, if nothing else. Might be less yes. silly, but <laughs> we'll give him the courage badge. <laughs> and and I can't thank you enough, Mike, for taking the time to, to do this with us. We'll we'll try to schedule a follow up if every, if every folks would like that. That'd be fun. Um, I think I think uh, the great thing about Mike, he's a good storyteller. Uh, if we can get them singing, we'll even get one. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, Chris. I mean, you, you're awesome. And, and and if you remember nothing, remember what Chris said earlier, I'd rather stretch than rest. And, and Chris, my brother, you are indeed a righteous entrepreneur yourself. And I, and I thank you for uh, allowing me to be here with you. Yeah. Well, we look forward to working with you in the future. And, you know, folks, uh, I'm available uh, for, for another 15 minutes or so if you, if you have something else you want to ask. We're gonna let Mike go because he does a lot of things. He, he he carved out some time during the day. We'll send you follow up information. And and DC Central Kitchen is always looking for volunteers and support. So if you have time, go see them in, in action. Uh, they do yeah. amazing stuff. We'll see you next November in, in person. We hope Thank so. You, Thanks again. Thank you, everybody. Take care.